Okay, so let, let us start. So, uh, hello, uh, this is Hock Kim. I'll be chairing Professor Cyborg's uh, colloquium today. So I'm very glad to introduce Professor Cyborg. Uh, as most of you will know very well, he's a world leading physicist and he works on many subjects, including quantum field theory, particle physics, string theory, condensed matter physics, among others. And in particular, I think his deep insights on quantum field theory has made many of these developments possible. And I think uh, during the course, he established, what's really important is that he established the modern notion of what quantum field theory is. I mean, far beyond, I mean, the traditional thing that we learned in the textbook. And I think today's lecture will also share some of these insights and his wisdom. And he'll give a talk with the title, Quantum Field Theory, Separation of Scales and Beyond. So please. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here and give the talk. Yeah, the time difference makes it a little bit challenging, but I hope we can manage it. Now, I'm not quite sure who the audience is. In fact, I asked just before the talk, and can you hear me okay, by the way? Yes, yes. Yeah, good. Uh, so I don't know who the audience is and what the level, nor can I see you. So I'm basically talking to myself. I can't see anybody. And it would really help if you ask questions. So I think to address this challenge, there are two ways. One, you interrupt me with questions if you have, and I'll do my best to answer them. And second, I structure the talk such that I will start at a very low level, such that everybody can understand. And I'll gradually go to more and more sophisticated things. And hopefully everybody will have some time that the level is perfect for, for them. So with that in mind, I'd like first to explain what the title means, why I picked that title. And the first thing is quantum field theory. Uh, quantum field theory is a very special theory, very successful. But before I describe briefly what it is, I would like to give kind of a broad brush description of physics, my view of what physics is, and such that we will see how quantum field theory fits into it. So I would like to, to uh, divide physics, all of physics, in a two by two plot. So the first axis is classical versus quantum. And the second axis is how many degrees of freedom we have. So starting with classical physics, we can start with a finite number of degrees of freedom. This is classical mechanics. Here we describe the time evolution of a finite number of particles. And I had to choose two photos, so I chose a Newton and Lagrange as two of the main people who contributed to our understanding of classical mechanics, and then there were many others who developed it further. So classical mechanics, it describes time evolution of a finite number of particles, and it is being described using ordinary differential equations. In fact, calculus, one of the motivations to, do, do, uh, to develop calculus, and in particular, ordinary differential equations, was classical mechanics. So this is more or less a well understood field. It has been described over the years in more and more abstract terms, more powerful and more abstract terms. And we are ready to move to the next thing in my two by two plot, which take the same theory, but have an infinite number of degrees of freedom. So as long as we have a finite number of degrees of freedom, it's classical mechanics. We have an infinite number of degrees of freedom. We call it classical field theory. Here we move to the 19th century and, and even the 20th century. And the people here that I put the photos of are Maxwell and Einstein, but we can also think of Navier and Stokes who described the, the motion of fluids and we can earn also many other people who contributed, Laplace and others. And the point here is that we have an infinite number, in fact, the continuum of degrees of freedom, for example, the electromagnetic field at every point over the velocity of the, of the fluid for the case of Navier-Stokes and or a metric for the case of Einstein's theory of relativity. And again, the natural mathematical setting is partial differential equations. So both classical mechanics and classical field theory, in fact, all of classical physics is being captured 
by calculus. And as I said, calculus was one of the motivations to, to what one of the motivations to develop calculus was to understand classical physics. As we move in the two by two plot, on the left side of the plot, I'll have finite number of degrees of freedom. And on the right, I will have an infinite number of degrees of freedom. So we are moving to quantum physics. And in quantum physics, we start with quantum mechanics. Here, the photo includes many more people. Many of you know, can recognize the faces. This is their photo taken during the survey meeting. And here we describe the time evolution of a finite number of quantum particles. For example, in the, the electrons in an atom, or we can have a larger number in more complicated systems, but still a finite number of quantum mechanical particles. And again, there's a very natural mathematical setting for it. We have a Hilbert space, and we have operators acting in the Hilbert space. A more sophisticated formulation of it is in terms of a functional integral or a path integral. And either way, this problem is more or less understood. There are still many interesting questions, many interesting challenges. But the question, the, the problem of quantum mechanics is a more or less settled field. And we still try and extract more and more applications, but the mathematical foundation is more or less settled. Next, we move to the last entry in this two by two map of physics, and this is quantum field theory. Here, we move in the x-axis, in the horizontal axis, we move from finite number of particles to an infinite number of particles. So in classical mechanics, we have classical mechanics and classical field theory. Now we have quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. So we have an infinite number of degrees of freedom, for example, the electromagnetic field. And a lot is known. I did not put any photos here. I'll put some photos later. And partly because this is still an active field of research, my personal view is that we do not yet understand the mathematical setting, unlike the three other entries in my two by two plot. Uh, we do not have the mathematical setting. Uh, what, it's not to say that what we're doing is wrong. What we're doing is correct and interesting and useful. I'll say more about that soon. But personally, I feel that a new intellectual structure is needed to describe quantum field theory, something that will be as solid as calculus is for classical physics. So where do we see quantum physics? Where will we see quantum field theory? I do not know uh, people in the audience which field they're from. So I'll give kind of a description of where in quantum field theory appears. And the summary of what I will say is that it appears everywhere. So, Quantum field theory is everywhere, and it appears in almost every branch of modern physics. We can start not in any particular significance, but we can start in particle physics. In particle physics, we describe the interactions of the elementary particles and the forces acting between them. And the language we use to describe, and we have a model, a very successful model, the standard model of particle physics which involves gauge fields and quarks and electrons and gluons and so forth in the Higgs particle. But in the language that's being used is the language of quantum field theory. And quantum field theory is enormously successful and enormously accurate. Here is an example of the success in the theory. Every electron is like a little magnet and we can calculate and measure how strong the magnet is. And in some natural units, this is the observed, the theoretical calculate, cal the theoretical prediction for the magnetic moment of the electron, how strong the magnet is. And this is the experimental measurement. As you can see, the spectacular agreement between them. Every digit here, as we move more and to more and more accurate description, every digit probes our understanding of physics in more and more detail. Like the one, the one here and the one here really probe the details of how we think of quantum electrodynamics, both quantum mechanics and the electromagnetic fields. And as we add more and more digits here, they probe our understanding of the weak force and the strong force. And the fact that we can perform such an enormously accurate calculation and such an enormously accurate experiment is a statement that we really know what we're doing. 
So some people criticize quantum field theory that it's not mathematically rigorous. This is valid criticism. But on the other hand, we clearly know what we are doing because this is clearly a spectacular success. No other branch of physics comes even close to such agreement between theory and experiment. And there are several limits, several lessons we can learn from it. One is in the fact that we have the ellipsis here, we should really do both the calculation and the experiment better to have more and more digits here so that we probe our understanding of physics better and better and make sure that no surprises are present. We also see that the experimentalists are ahead. They have more significant digits than the theorists. So it means that the theorists should work harder. I should Achille. end here before we continue that recently Achille. there were some rumors that a similar Achille. calculation for a muon, the muon is a heavier cousin of the electron. It also has a magnetic dipole moment. It's also like a little magnet. And there are some digits at the end here do not quite match between theory and experiment. And the jury is still out on whether this is a real discrepancy or there's just a mistake in the calculation or maybe a mistake in the experiment. So I'm not going to say much about that. The second place quantum field theory appears is in uh, condensed matter physics. Yes. Professor Cyborg, uh, so elementary question. When we calculate this electric electron dipole moment, we should subtract out divergences. So regularization, renormalization, dependence affect this value, or I mean, this is completely independent of the subtraction of this value? Yes. Yeah, that's an excellent question. When we do calculations in quantum field theory, there are divergences and they have to be handled and they have to be handled correctly. <clears throat> and where they are handled correctly, they lead to this prediction. So this prediction is totally unambiguous. And the fact that we have such good agreement between theory and experiment tells us that we really know what we're doing and the way we subtract all these infinities is correct. The modern way of thinking about quantum field theory actually involves no infinities. Infinities are only kind of a way of doing the calculation. The more modern way to understand it, there's ne never anything infinite. We're just dealing with finite quantities. And I'll say a few words about that later. I see. And thank, thank you for asking. If there are other questions, please interrupt me. The second place quantum field theory appears is in condensed matter physics. In fact, the development of quantum field theory over the past several decades, so almost a century now, it was really hand in hand between condensed matter physics and particle physics, where ideas from one discipline inspired developments in the other discipline. And I cannot imagine this enterprise without the close influence or the course fertilization between particle physics and condensed matter physics. So in condensed matter physics, quantum field theory is being used to describe the long distance properties of materials. What kind of phases materials can have and what are the phase transitions between them? So we started short distances with some electrons and they interact and so forth. And it could be very complicated. And at long distances, we have a metal and the metal conducts electricity or conducts heat, or we could have an insulator or we could have a superconductor or a superfluid. And there are lots and lots of phases and new phases are being discovered all the time. And all of them should be captured by some continuum quantum field theory. So quantum field theory is also important in condensed matter physics as it captures the long distance behavior of materials. And I'll say more about that soon. It also appears in cosmology. When we discuss the early universe, theory of inflation of the universe expands and, and all the details that are associated with that, the language that we use is the language of quantum field theory. And it also appears in string theory and in the study of quantum gravity. And this is really the main tool we use in modern developments in quantum gravity and string theory. And quantum field theory appears here in different places it appears on the string wall sheet. The string is a one-dimensional object. As it evolves in time, it sweeps a two-dimensional wall sheet. And we have a theory living on that two-dimensional wall sheet as if it is a theory with one space dimension and one time. Also, the low energy approximation of field 
of string theory is that is given by quantum field theory. Quantum field theory describes what happens at very low energies where gravity is more is not important. And using more, the more modern development of gauge gravity duality, quantum field theory is even used to describe the whole theory itself, the whole complete theory, not a truncation of the theory, not an approximation, but the full theory. So every one of these bullet points deserves a whole talk, but I'm not going to go into it. So we mentioned that it appears in particle physics. We mentioned it appeared in condensed matter physics, in cosmology, and in string theory, but also in mathematics. Over the past several decades, quantum field theories had enormous impact on mathematics, especially geometry and topology, inspiring many developments in addressing new questions. So it's clear that quantum field theory is very important. It appears everywhere. And it has implications to different branches of physics. It is still an active uh, field of research. And there are a lot about it that we are still surprised. We are surprised when we learn this, how it works. And I personally think that something very exciting is still hiding. And I encourage the younger people in the audience to be interested in this field because I'm quite certain that in the coming decades, this field will continue to blossom. So let me focus on one particular aspect of quantum field theory, which is particularly important, and I would like to discuss it from various perspectives. And this is the issue of separation of scales. Now, separation of scales is the statement that in different length scales, we have different descriptions of nature. So I wrote here that it happens in physics, but in fact, it happens in all of sciences, including social sciences. And I will say more about that momentarily. We have different effective descriptions at different length scales. And I'll give examples soon. There are several, re several ways of thinking about it. One of them is it's a simplification. We can study what happens at one length scale independent of the details at other length scales. We can study physics at the length of say one meter, and we don't need to understand this, what happens at the scale of the whole universe. We don't need to understand cosmology to understand the physics at one meter. Nor do we have to understand atomic physics or even particle physics to study the physics of one meter. So this is the simplification of the story. It's independent, independent of the details at different length scales. I would like to say that this means that nature is kind to us. It's kind to us because otherwise it would have been totally hopeless. If in order to describe physics at the length scale of a meter, like when you have a particle, on a, say a ball rolling on an inclined plane, or when Newton studied apples dropping from a tree, it was he was fortunate that he did not have to understand all the details of the solar system and all the details of atomic physics at the same time. Otherwise, it would have been hopeless to find what's going on. In philosophy, this separation of scales is known as reductionism. We constantly reduce what's going on to more basic rules at shorter and shorter distances. So we study what happens at one length scale, and then we try to understand, we explore what happens at shorter distances, such that our earlier understanding of what happens at longer distances becomes a consequence of the better understanding at short distances. We reduce the problem, hence the word reductionism, to the more basic rules, the rules that operate at short distances. Let me give some examples. The first example is something that was very important early on, thermodynamics. People discussed thermodynamics long before they knew of statistical physics. Notions of temperature, entropy, free energy, and so forth were defined and understood long before we knew that this describes statistical properties of material. So there was an effective description of thermodynamics, which was later understood as kind of an average of the fact that at shorter distances, we have many degrees of freedom and lots of fluctuations, and thermodynamics is the effective description at longer distances. 
Another example that I've already alluded to is that of hydrodynamics. I mentioned the Navier-Stokes equations as differential equations, partial differential equations that describe the flow of a fluid. Or describe so if fluid flows, we have how the velocity and the density could change if it's compressible. If it's not compressible, the density cannot change. And we have some differential equation of a smooth material or smooth flow. In fact, nothing really flows. If you look at it at short distances, there are atoms there, lots of atoms, and they bounce around and they move in all sorts of directions. And the dy dynamics is quite complicated because there's so many degrees of freedom. What hydrodynamics gives us is an effective description, describing some averages of the motion. And it's much simpler than keeping track of all the fundamental degrees of freedom. Giving another example from a different line of work, I wrote epidemiology here. Recently, many of us became interested in epidemiology for obvious reasons. And there was a pandemic, there still is a pandemic, and we can study it at different length scales. We can study it at the most microscopic scale where there are viruses and they have an RNA. And by understanding the RNA, vaccines can be developed. We can also study the pandemic and the, the rules of how we behave with respect to each other. We keep separation, we have masks, we try not to, to be too close to other people and so forth. And we can also study it at the longer scale, like restriction motion between countries. Now, in order to understand how far we have to be from each other, we do not need to understand what happens at short distances when we study the details of the structure of the virus. Nor is this affecting the rules of closing countries and restricting flights. So we see that at different length scales, we have different descriptions more or less independent of most of the details at the other scales, although they influence each other. So some, important, some details are important, but most of the details are not important as we move from scale to scale. In the context of quantum field theory, this separation of scales, that the theory is simpler, or our understanding is simpler if we focus on one scale, is known as the renormalization rule. And if I had to choose two people to put here, I'd put Wilson and Weinberg. There are, of course, many others who also contributed to it. And in the context of quantum field theory, this is not just a philosophical qualitative idea that we can separate things between scales. It's a very quantitative phenomenon. And we can use that to write equations and to turn that to be a powerful tool that allows us to predict values of various experiments that we can perform. So we have different theories at short distances and at long distances. So in the coming slides, I'm going to talk about the relation between what happens at shorter distances and what happens at longer distances. So we're so going can I, to- Can I ask a question, about... please? Sure. So this separation of scale, scales, sh should I take it as an empirical fact or should there be a deeper reason? Or... That's an absolutely fantastic question. And that's really the, the topic of this talk. Okay, so, okay. so far, for okay. centuries, it was a fact. I don't know if I should take it as a principle or mm -hmm. as a consequence, but it is a fact that has mm -hmm. been extremely helpful mm -hmm. because we were lucky that it existed and therefore we could make progress. And we constantly make progress exploring what happens at shorter and shorter distances and at longer and longer distances. Hmm. Uh, to steal my thunder, I'm going to say now that in a few slides, this will no longer be the case. I see. So if you ask me, well, I'll talk about that in sure. much more detail. Okay. But Thank you. Okay. So far, it is a fact, it's a fortunate fact that has been very helpful. And okay. Yeah, let me leave it to that, and later you can ask your question again. Sure, thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. 
so uh, this separation of scale or the uh, in the broader perspective can i understand it is that if you have a large number of num numbers there exists a measure called a central mean or something that is a good representation of these large number of measures so does it what my, okay my question i suppose is does it naturally stem from the behavior of a large distribution maybe of degrees of freedom of numbers etc in general it's not there's no reason why the, why this should happen so some quantity, if you have many degrees of freedom, you could be interested just in the averages. And sometimes right. that's a good thing. It's good if the fluctuations around the average are small. If the fluctuations right. around the average are large, then there's no reason, reason to focus on the average. So right. it might be that when we have lots of degrees of freedom, we have effective degrees of freedom that are simpler and there are fewer of them. But that mm -hmm. doesn't have to be the case. In the examples I presented before, it was the case. Right. But a priori, if you think, why does it happen? I don't know any reason why it should happen. I see. I see. Maybe okay. God was kind to us that he created the universe in such a way that the problem can be broken to scales, and then it is easier for understand for it's easier for us to understand how it works. But I do not know any principle why it has to be the case. I see. In Thank fact, you. I would soon argue that that's not always the case. I see. But so far, we are sometimes in the 60s and 70s or 80s in my description of physics here. And that is the case. There is no counterexample. Okay. Thank you. So what do we do? We have some theory of true distances. And we use the phrase UV, ultraviolet. And I use some kind of purple here because if I put it in ultraviolet, you couldn't see it. In long distances, we refer to it as infrared, and that put it some kind of a red. Again, if they've been infrared, you couldn't see it. So when I say UV, it's the theory of short distances. If I say IR, it's the theory of long distances. So we formulate the problem at short distances, and we ask ourselves, what is the effective theory at long distances? In other words, we can say that this is the problem, we put some electrons in a box and we put some other materials in and we shake it and we, can, and we compress it, et cetera. And then we ask ourselves, what comes out? What's the long distance behavior? What happens at longer distances? So this is the question and this is the answer. That's one way of thinking about it. The opposite way of thinking about it is also valid. We see physics at some length scale, which we can call the infrared. And we can ask ourselves, what is the deeper theory, the deeper truth, the shorter distances that appears here that eventually gives rise to the effective theory at long distances? So this is really a two-way street. The arrow, the logical arrow goes from here to here. This is more fundamental than that. This is the question. This is the answer. In condensed matter physics, we usually go this way. We know what's going on at short distances. We have some atoms and so forth, and they interact. And then we would like to predict the phase of matter. But we can also go the other way around. We have a, some new phase of matter. We'd like to understand what's the short distance theory that gives rise to it. In particle physics, we, have, we put now the standard model of particle physics here. And we would like to understand what's the deeper truth, what happens at shorter distances that gives rise to it. In the past, before the standard model was known, people looked at, say, pions and hadrons and electrons and so forth. This was the effective theory. And the standard model turned out to be the short distance theory that gives rise to it. So this is what happens at short distances. This is what happens at long distances. And one way of thinking about this whole setup is that we scan all possible ultraviolet, all possible short distance systems. And we would like to find what are the possible long distance behavior that we can find here. And the nice thing is that the infrared theory, the long distance theory, is independent of most of the details of the short distance theory. Technically, it's called universality. Because a lot of changes here at short distances have no effect at long distances. This is the simplification that we get. We can study what happens at long distances with very little information from short distances. 
Most of the details here do not matter. For example, if we have lots of molecules and they flow together, we don't need to know where every molecule is at every moment. All we are really interested in is some kind of average of the flow. So the infrared theory is independent of most of the details, and that's why it's very efficient. And the term we use in, is an effective description. It's effective because, because it is effective. We don't need to do all the complicated work. We have easier work to, easier equations to work with. And one example of this is that the short distance theory could be on a lattice. We have a lattice. In nature, we have crystals. And at long distances, it looks continuous. If you look around yourself, you sit on a chair. There are atoms in the chair. And the chair looks pretty smooth. It looks like a continuous material, even though at shorter distances, there are atoms and there's a lot of structure there. All the roughness of short distances is washed out by the time we are at long distances. An example to keep in mind is the approximating a sum by an integral. We can define an integral by thinking of it as a sum and then taking a limit. Or alternatively, we can say that we have a sum and we approximate it by an integral. This is this two-way street from the UV to the IR. And I'll say more about that soon. So what can happen? So we start at short distances, we say with some electrons, and we find ourselves at long distances with some phases. So here is a rough classification of the phases that we could find. So we start at large but finite volume. There's some Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian has a spectrum. So we diagonalize the Hamiltonian. There's some spectrum of the Hamiltonian. One class of models are known as gapped of massive model, massive theories. An example is a free massive particle. We have free massive particles. We have a ground state. That's no particle at all. Then we can have one particle, and it can have various momenta. We can also have two particles, three particles, etc. And we can have a unique ground state. Or there could be several degenerate ground states. And the physics that describes them comes under the name of topological field theory. So we can be interested in the whole thing, that's the full quantum field theory, or we could be interested only in the ground states, which are captured by a special quantum field theory known as topological field theory. The second possibility is that the gap closes, namely, we do not have a separation in energy between the ground state and the first excited state. It's called gapless models or massless models. Examples are free massless particles. For example, photons are massless. And when we have photons, we can have a photon with very, very low momentum. And then it has very, very uh, low energy. So photons with very long wavelengths have very low energy, and the energy is really bounded by zero, but for arbitrarily small energy, we have a state in the spectrum. And the, this could be a, a theory of free particles, free photons. This is electrodynamics without matter, but it could be more complicated, like various other theories that are gapless, and here the name, the technical term is conformal field theory. So there are different field theories, labeled by an adjective, it's topological or conformal or gapped or not or gapless, all depending on the behavior that they exhibit. And the classification is actually much more complicated and more refined, depending on more details in this picture. So as I said, we have different theories, one at short distances and one at long distances. At short distances, we have the UV theory, and at long distances, we have the IR theory. And continuum quantum field theory is very helpful to organize and classify the possible behavior at long distances. What kind of phases can be there? I already mentioned the material could be an insulator, it could be a conductor, it could be a superconductor. It could exhibit all sorts of funny behavior. Some of them are all of them are experimentally verifiable, and some of them even have technological implications. In the opposite direction, if new phases are being discovered, this tells us something new about quantum field theory, because the new phase has to be describable 
using quantum field theory. And if we can't do that, then it's a challenge for the quantum field theorist. Now, the long distance theory, the infrared theory is expected to be scale invariant because we go to very, very low energies. And therefore we can just scale everything and make just say that we can scale things that things should go back to themselves. The theory is scale invariant. And the technical terms, it should be a conformal field theory, or if there's a gap, it could be a topological field theory. And if there's a unique ground state, it's an invertible topological field theory and so forth. So there's a whole zoo of examples depending on various properties of these systems. And this is the interesting flow from the UV to the IR. Again, we formulate the question in the UV. This is where we formulate our questions. And this is the answer. So we can give the students a homework. This is what happens at short distances. What's the long distance description of what's going on? We can also go in the opposite direction and go at long, start at long distances. And that's what we see. What kind of theory at short distances can give rise to this behavior? So as a good example is to study lattice models. We can approximate space or space time by a lattice, for example, a cubic lattice, but we can also study other lattices, and then place degrees of freedom on the sides of the lattice at various points here, known also as vertices, or in the links, also known as edges, or on the plaquettes, also known as faces, etc. So we place degree of freedom in various places here. We postulate some short distance inter interaction like the degree of freedom here times the degree of freedom here times the degree of freedom here. A, for example, coupling between nearest neighbors, next to nearest neighbors, et cetera. And we write some such kind of a Hamiltonian that describes these degrees of freedom. And typically the low energy is described by a continuum quantum field theory. The lattice becomes a continuum. And I've already said that a number of times in the talk, but it's still correct. So in condensed matter physics, the lattice is physical. There is a lattice, there's a crystal, there's a degree of, the degrees of freedom there and they interact with each other. And our goal is to find what happens at long distances. In high energy physics, the behavior is different. In high energy physics, the lattice is being used, it not because it is there, but it is used in order to help us define quantum field theory more rigorously. It also helps us do calculations. If we want to put quantum field theory on the computer, so the computer will give us answer about the behavior of the system. We discretize space. And then we have a finite problem that can be put on the computer. This, I gave the example before of doing integrals. We can say that the problem we are interested in in quantum field theory is the integral. And we can put it on the lattice. This is how we perform calculations with interval if we want to do it with a computer. We discretize the space, and then the interval becomes a sum. So this is what I wanted to say about that. And so far, everything is nice. We have quantum field theory. It works very well. And we have this separation of scales. And the UV and the IR do not talk to each other. Well, I've already mentioned that life is not so simple and we can have UVIR mixing. And we know of several examples where the ultraviolet short distances and the long distances mix together. So we have now for the rest of the talk, I will talk about situations where we don't have separation of scales and the long distance and the short distance phenomena are mixed together and Long distance physics reflects high energy physics. So first of all, this is common in gravity. If we want to explore high energy of gravity, we want to explore what happens at shorter and shorter distances. So we think, oh, all we need to do is build a collider or an accelerator, which will accelerate particles to very high energy so that they will get very close together. And this will te tell us what happens at shorter distances. If we study gravity, this is not what happens. As we try to concentrate a lot of energy in a small volume, rather than telling us what happens at short distances, we create a black hole. And the more energy we pump in, 
the bigger is the large is the black hole. And as it is getting bigger and bigger, it hides from us what happens at shorter distances. Also common in gravity, especially in its string theory description, is that we have various dualities relating what ha happens at long distances and what happens at short distances. And many questions and confusions in quantum gravity circle around this issue, circle around the fact that in the context of gravity, we do not have complete separation of scales. Now, separation of scales cannot be completely wrong because it's true in the universe. It's true in quantum field theory. It's true in our description of the system, but it's not as simple as I described it. But a diehard would say, yes, this is all because of gravity. Maybe in a theory of gravity without, sorry, maybe in a theory without gravity, this cannot happen. So the first sign that this is not the case, namely, we can have mixing of UV and IR even without gravity, is by studying string theory and take a limit of string theory when Newton constant goes to zero. If we take such a limit, if Newton constant is zero, gravity doesn't exist. So this is a way of decoupling gravity out of string theory, and we are left with a theory which is not gravitational. Typically, it's quantum field theory, but certain peculiar examples exhibit UV IR mixing. So by studying string theory, that's something that happened over the last few decades, people came across various situations where the short distance and the long distance physics are completely mixed together. And I'm not going to discuss it in detail, I'll just list them. One class of examples is known as little string theory. It's a non-gravitational theory. It has no local operators. It exhibits T-duality, that's more for the tech, for more technical. The upshot of it is that long distance and short distance are completely mixed together. And the second example is field theory in a non-commutative space. This comes out very naturally out of string theory. In this case, a dipole, the degrees of freedom are dipoles, and a dipole with high momentum is large in space. So as we try to make the dipole have larger and larger momentum, the dipole grows in space in another direction. Also, if we compare this theory on a non-commutative space on a theory with a commutative space, the non-commutative, the theory on the non-commutative space has fewer infer UV divergences, and instead it has new IR divergences. So somebody asked me earlier about these divergences that needs to be regularized in quantum field theory. On a non-commutative space, there are fewer divergences, but instead we have new infrared divergences. So I'm not going to say more about it, except to say that UVIR mixing exists in gravity for sure. It also exists in various examples that came out of string theory, which have nothing to do with gravity. And telling us it's kind of a warning sign that maybe UV, this UVIR mixing is quite common. And maybe we were fooled by thinking that it never happens. It had guided us over the years, it was very helpful, but it doesn't have to be the case. So somebody asked me before, does it have to be the case? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Here are some examples. And for the uh, rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about some exotic lattice models that also lead to UVIR mixing. These are systems on a lattice with short distance interaction. They look completely innocent and the UV and the IR mix together. Was there a question? Yes, please. Uh, yeah. Can I ask a question uh, about the string theory and T-duality things? Can I understand that separation of scale fails just because the scale itself is not well defined? That's correct. So the question, actually doesn't exist in that case. In, that's correct. So it's not well defined, but uh, you can try and define it. The point is that what you call big is something I would call small. And what yes. you call small, I will call big. So there's an ambiguity. It's well defined, uh -huh. but there are several definitions and they're not the same. Oh, I see, okay. Uh -huh. That's so maybe that's a rather peculiar example among the many examples that you have given? Well, in the context of gravity, it's very common. Mm. And, but the examples I gave here are theories without gravity. It's true that they started their life 
they started their lives as mm. situation in string theory. But in the end of the day, there's a theory without gravity and the UV and the IR mix. And there's no clear separation of scales. Okay, okay. Yeah. The examples I'm going to talk about now are even more conventional. Okay. Conventional okay. in the sense that, well, in the sense that I will soon make precise. But again, the UV and the IR mix in a non-trivial way. We can go to lower and lower energy. There's nothing wrong with that. And we can explore what happens along this edge at low energy by just not pumping a lot of energy into the system. But we will see a very sense, the system will be very sensitive to what happens at short distances. Okay, thank you. So over the last several years, many exotic models of various kinds were found. Uh, this is a list of some of them. It's called Lifshitz theory. The details are not important and I'm going to discuss some of them in a little bit more detail. And the main thing about these theories is that they do not have a standard continuum limit. Even though I can define them on the lattice, there are various definitions of them. You look at them superficially, they look totally innocent, but their long distance behavior is not captured by a standard continuum quantum field theory. And the challenge in this system stems from their peculiar properties. So let me mention some of the peculiar properties. First of all, these systems are characterized by unusual symmetries. Question. They have global symmetries, symmetries of the system that are depend on the position, unlike ordinary global symmetries. They also have excitations with restricted mobility. There are particles that have to be that are stuck at a point, or the particles that can move along the x direction but not along the y direction. They. The, when I say the particle is stuck at a point, we can kick it with as much energy as we want. The particle is not going to move to another place. It can split to several different particles in different places, but there's a single particle that cannot move to a different place. So that's quite peculiar. There's also a very large ground state degeneracy. I mentioned earlier that the system can have be gapped or gapless, and then there might be one or several ground states. Here, the ground states, the number of ground states is a complicated function, say two to the k. So function k that depends on the number of sites on the lattice in the x, y, and z direction. And as we try to take a limit and the number of sites goes to infinity, the number of ground states can also diverge. It could be finite or it could be infinite. And I will soon give examples. We have all sorts of phenomena of UVIR mixing, where long distance phenomena are very sensitive to short distance details. And there are many other peculiarities. So here I just threw on a slide some of the peculiarities of this system. I'll soon discuss them in more detail. So this leads to a whole bunch of questions. Are these peculiarities related? So these are different examples. They look totally different. My view is that these are the examples that people stumbled on. For all we know, there are many other examples exhibiting even more bizarre properties. So are these peculiarities related? Not all examples have all the peculiarities. So it's clear that we don't understand that completely. How should we think about such theories? They fall outside the standard framework of theories that we usually study, like quantum electrodynamics. How should we organize these theories? Can we classify them? Are there more examples? And in particular, is there a quantum field theory description of them? So let me go in a little bit more detail and describe some of these peculiar examples. This was not the first one that was found, but it's one that is relatively straightforward to describe. It's known as the X cube model. So we have a lattice and we put the qubit or Z2 spin on every spatial link. So there's a degree of freedom, which is a spin in either up or down on every link. And the Hamiltonian is a sum of terms, terms associated with cubes and terms associated with sites. So for every cube on the lattice, we take sigma one, the sigma one, the metrics of Pauli, and we multiply on the various links around the cube. 
And for every site, there are three terms in the x, y, and z direction. So this is in the z direction. We we'll multiply sigma three on all the, all the links around that site, which are in the x, y plane. So don't try and follow the details. It's, it's a lot of work to actually extract the physics of this model. But what I want to emphasize is this is an instant, innocent looking local Hamiltonian. There's a finite dimensional Hilbert space on every link. <clears throat> there are some interactions between neighboring links, between nearby links. Nothing looks unusual here. It does not look that different than, say, the Ising model, where there are the Z2 spins on every site that the nearest neighbors interact with each other. So this model has many peculiar features. One of them is that on a lattice with LX, LY, and LZ sites, say with periodic boundary conditions, there's a huge ground state degeneracy. The number of states is two to a power, and the power grows linearly in the number of sites. So the entropy, which is the logarithm of the number of states, grows linearly in the size of the system. It's actually quite surprising that it depends at all on the number of lattice sites, because it means that it's not proportional to the volume, it's proportional to the length, and hence it is sub-extensive. It's not ex like an extensive quantity. And at the same time, it is infinite if we take the number of sites to infinity. This is not something that usually happens in quantum field theory. So if we take any continuum limit, we take the lattice space equal to zero, the total number of sites to infinity, holding the length of the system fixed, we get an infinite number of ground states. And this ground state degeneracy, and these ground states reflect short distance physics. The only way to get such a large number of states that depends on how many sites the system has means that the ground states reflect short distance physics. So if we make LX bigger by one, we add one more layer of sites. What happens is that the total number of states is multiplied by four, according to this formula. So we, it's not just we add one more state, the whole thing is multiplied by four. So it's a huge ground state degeneracy and it reflects UVIR mixing. The spectrum is gapped. And furthermore, if we deform the Hamiltonian a little bit, the long, long distance physics or the low energy physics does not change. So the model is robust on the small changes. So you don't even need to study the particular Hamiltonian that I wrote down or precisely the Hamiltonian that these people wrote down. You can deform it by a little bit and the answers don't change. The model also has localized excitations with restricted mobility. There are particles that are stuck at a point. There are line of the particles that can move along the line, say along the X or the Y or the Z direction. And they are plane ons in the particles that are restricted to a plane. And there are also excitations that can just move freely through the system. So what we see here is that these things that I mentioned before, we have large ground state degeneracy, sensitivity to short distance physics, and particles with restricted mobility. A more peculiar example was actually given earlier by Ha. He studied a model which has two qubits at every site. So putting two spins at every site. And there are two kinds of terms in the Hamiltonian, one multiplying one for tensor sigma one around the cube and the other multiply one tensor sigma three around the cube in a particular pattern. The details are not important. Don't try to follow them. What I'm emphasizing here is that this is, again, an innocent looking Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian, it looks like short distance, small finite Hilbert space per site and short distance interactions. And the model is very peculiar. Again, we have excitation with restricted mobility. The ground state degeneracy is even more crazy than in the previous example. The number of ground state is two to an exponent, and the exponent is a function of LX, LY, and Z, the number of sites. And this is a complicated number theoretic function. And it's complicated even when LX equals LY and LZ. And what's more peculiar is that it's not monotonic in L. We can take various values of LX, LY, and LZ, 
so that it grows linearly in L. But we can also take sequence of L going to infinity, such that this k is finite. So the behavior as a function of Lx, Ly, and Lz is erratic. We add one more layer of sites, and the total number of ground states drop to a small number. We add one more, and it grows to an exponentially large number. This means that the limit Li goes to infinity is ambiguous. We cannot ask what happens as we take L to infinity because the answer depends on how exactly we take L to infinity. To which sequence of values do we take L to infinity? And of course, it raises the question, is there any continuum limit? Is there any continuum description where all the Ls go to infinity? The third class of examples that I want to mention the examples due to oh, yes sorry so uh, it might be a naive question so for these fractons can i see from the hamiltonian as what is really breaking this isotropy i mean what does what chooses this particular plane or particular line for you C can it be seen from the hamiltonian or is it something more okay remote? so that's a very good question the Ham if you just stare at the hamiltonian and you didn't do hard work you cannot immediately tell that it's going to exhibit this behavior so there are Hamiltonians that look very similar. Okay, mm -hmm. some uh, you don't multiply this time that, but you multiply them in a different form, and it does not exhibit the peculiar behavior. Mm -hmm. So I do not know how to say a priori that this such behavior is going to happen. I see. I see. I see. These models that I presented are actually solvable. You can completely diagonalize the Hamiltonian and know the spectrum. And as you do that, you find that it exhibits this behavior. But you first have to solve the system. There are more sophisticated methods that you can identify their symmetries and then see that something is going like this is going to happen. But you still need to work. It's not obvious. I see. I see. Don't just stare at it and you say, oh, that's obvious. This is going to happen. I see. I see. Okay, thank you. So the other class of models were written down by Fretko, and that was followed up on earlier work in the continuum on the lattice by Chu and others, who tried to generalize electrodynamics. So in electrodynamics or in Maxwell theory, we have a scalar potential with gauge symmetry that is shifted by D0 alpha. Alpha is the gauge parameter. And in electrodynamics, there's a vector potential, which transforms by a derivative of a spatial derivative of alpha. That's the gauge symmetry of electrodynamics. And what these people said, let's put a tensor here, a symmetric tensor, rather than a, rather than a vector. So it's not a vector potential, but it's a tensor potential. And we can play the same game that is being played in electrodynamics. We can form elect, electric and magnetic field by acting on these guys with derivatives in such that the alpha, alpha drops out, so we can transform Aij or A0 and Aij and Aik. And this E and B field, electric and magnetic fields, uh, do not transform when we perform the transformation. And we can write a Lagrangian, which is E squared minus B squared, or we can write a Hamiltonian, which is E squared plus B squared. And this system is exactly solvable, and it's massless. And it's very similar to electrodynamics. It has kind of photons, but the photons are excitations of where they are plane waves of these potentials. Now, this is how the fields transform under the gauge transformation. And because of that, there is Gauss law. In ordinary systems, Gauss law is the statement that the divergence of the electric field is the charge density. In this instance, the, since E has two, two indices, we have to take a double derivative. So a double derivative of the electric field is the charge density. And as a result, both the conserved charge, both the total charge and the dipole charge are conserved. You can just multiply that and integrate. So when we have such a funny gauge principle, which is not common, this does not happen in electrodynamics, but let's imagine there is a system that has such a gauge principle. Both the electric charge and the dipole charge are conserved. That's a very strange system. Both electric charge and dipole charge are conserved. And because of that, we have particles with restricted mobility. 
Because if we have a charged particle and we try to move it elsewhere, this will conserve the charge, but it will not conserve the dipole charge. So this is kind of an intuitive way to understand how we can get particles with restricted mobility by having such kind of a gauge symmetry, which is not the standard one. This, of course, leads us to back to the questions I mentioned earlier. Are there more examples, or is this all there is? <laughs> Other more examples with more exotic phenomena. And what is the underlying reason of this bizarre behavior? Some people before asked me, can I tell a priori whether this is going to be or not? And the answer is no, I do not know how to answer that a priori. So what's going on here? How should we organize these uh, phases? How should we classify them? They are out clearly outside the standard framework that we have been studying for decades now of continuum quantum field theory capturing the long distance behavior. So these are the kind of questions, and there are many other questions uh, that are related to it. And people try to write various continuum Lagrangians for it, continuum Hamiltonian. So I'm just going to flash equation just to show you that we are not just having words, but we can write formulas. And the details, again, are not important. So if we just follow our nodes and try to take the continuum limit the way we would have normally been doing, we find examples like this. So this is one class of models. There's a scalar theory with a Lagrangian, which has time derivative and two spatial derivatives. The four spatial derivatives, rather two spatial derivatives. An example is the well-known Lifshitz theory. There are other models. Uh, depending on how we contract the indices. I've already mentioned these gauge theories where the electric field has two indices, and therefore there are two derivatives here. So all these examples have high, are higher derivatives. Some low number terms with low number of derivatives are absent, but then we have terms with higher derivatives, and the terms with higher derivatives eventually lead to the peculiar behavior. We can also write various terms, Simon's theories, and it's a very rich subject. And there are many other examples. And the common thing to all of these is that the high derivative terms lead to important subtleties. And in fact, these models, if we just try to analyze them using the standard rules of quantum field theory, they are quite challenging. They are quite complicated, and they exhibit non-standard behavior. So this is how I spent the pandemic. This is our collaborator. This was taken, this is a Zoom. We were working mostly through Zoom. And this was early in the pandemic. I'm sitting in my chair in my office, the same, way, the same place I'm sitting now. But at that point in time, I did not yet know how to create, a, how to put a background so you could see the office, the, my true home office behind. So the questions we study are, what do such quantum field theories mean? When we have such high derivative terms, it turns out that the theory is quite complicated. And because of this particular structure of the high derivative terms, we need to study various discontinuous field configurations. That led to very subtle global structure. How, do, how are fluxes quantized? What are the operators of the theory? What are the defects? How should we think about all these examples? What is the precise relation between the continuum theory and the underlying lattice model? After all, we would like to describe a particular lattice model, and we found studying a particular continuum model. Are they the same or not the same? Is the continue, does the continuum model that we write down, that what does it have to do with the original lattice model? What does it capture? What does it not capture? So we found many results. Some of, some of these questions, we could answer them. And we found many results about many models, <clears throat> but we don't have a universal answer. So what we learned is that typically, the continuum theories have more symmetries than the underlying lattice models. That's true even in standard systems. It's often the case that in the continuum, we have more symmetries. For example, on the lattice, we have symmetry at the lattice translation, which is a discrete operation. In the continuum, we have symmetry under continuous translation. Also, on the lattice, sometimes we have more global, fewer global symmetries than in the continuum. So one thing we found is a new set of lattice models, 
that exhibit more symmetries, and they are closer to the continuum theories. These models are easier to analyze and are also closer to the continuum. And we have done that, to, for example, for the, this X cube model that I mentioned earlier. Another thing we realize that starting with the lattice, we can study two different limits. One limit is what we can call the continuum limit. We take the lattice spacing to zero, the number of sites to infinity, holding the length fixed. That's the normal limit we take when we want to study continuum quantum field theory in finite volume. So when people say simulate quantum field theory on the computer, say they study the strong, theory, the strong force or QCD on the lattice, that's the limit they take. The lattice spacing going to zero, the number of sites to infinity, holding the total size of the system fixed. Another limit we could take is the thermodynamic limit. Hold lattice spacing fixed and take the number of sites to infinity. Now, here we could also later take the total length to infinity. And in normal systems, these two limits commute. In normal systems, we could first remove the lattice spacing by making the lattice denser and denser, and then make the total length of the system infinite. Or we could first take the total number of sites to infinity and then take the lattice spacing to zero. In normal systems, these two limits commute because they reflect different physics. Here, they do not commute. So this is quite peculiar that the removing the UV cutoff and removing the IR cutoff are two non-commuting limits. We can also study other limits. And as we take other limits, we find even more different theories. This is clearly telling us that we have some UVIR mixing. We formulate the theory on the lattice, and we try to remove the lattice. And depending on how we remove the lattice, we get different answers. That's the sign of this UVIR mixing. So we started with a big description of what quantum field theory is how it fits in general in physics. I had this two by two block of a classical versus quantum and finite number of degrees of freedom versus infinite number of degrees of freedom. I said how wonderful, how marvelous quantum field theory is, how it works very accurately. It is being used in different branches of physics. I described it as the language of physics. It allows us to classify phases so we formulate something at short distances and we find something else at long distances. And as we go to long distances, quantum field theory works well. And it works well because of separation of scales, because the UV and the IR don't talk to each other. And then I showed examples where this is not the case. So let me summarize the talk. Quantum field theory is everywhere. It appears as the language of physics. I think nobody's going to dispute this fact. This is just a fact. It's enormously powerful. It appears in different branches of physics, and it's clearly the language we use. And a fundamental property of quantum field theory, this separation of scales. I said that it's not even for quantum field theory. It's for all of knowledge. This is this reductionism, where we have different effective descriptions at different length scales. And one consequence of that is that most of the details of what happens at short distances, most of the details, of the UV theory, do not affect the long distance infrared behavior. So that's the standard thing. That's what you study in your quantum field theory course. Now, if you're a little bit more sophisticated and you study some gravity and string theory, you learn that in gravity, that's not the case. In gravity, the UV and the IR mixed together, and that's very common in string theory. In fact, we, there are some examples where we start in string theory, we remove Newton's constant, we find the limit without gravity, and that limit without gravity also exhibits mixing between the UV and the IR. So the UV and the IR are mixed together even without gravity. So this subtlety, this peculiarity, this non-standard of this exotic behavior 
can arise even in a theory which does not have any gravity. So this has nothing to do with gravity. And then came these lattice models, which look even more conventional. So the other examples, the earlier examples, we started with the model of gravity with the coupled gravity. Now we have models of gravity never appeared. And we have standard looking lattice Hamiltonians, and they exhibit the same behavior, UVIR mixing outside the standard framework of quantum field theory. And these exotic models include many models. I gave a list of them with totally different behavior coming studied by different people. And they exhibit different interesting uh, properties, which reflect, among other things, this UVIR mixing. And this is the large ground state degeneracy. Sometimes the, the behavior of the number of ground states is such that there isn't even a well-defined limit as we take the number of sites to infinity. The number, of, the number of ground states, as we take the number of sites to infinity, the number of ground states varies in an erratic way as a function of n. The observables change at the length, uh, the length uh, the, or the size of the lattice. So we can, the, when we compute correlation functions, the correlation functions vary at very short distances, even when we look at very long distance behavior. So we study correlation functions at long distances and we move the operators a little bit and the results change dramatically. Also, we have these excitations with restricted mobility. The excitation with restricted mobility also reflect some UVIR mixing, but I don't have time to explain why. And all these peculiarities seem incompatible with the framework of quantum field theory. They do not occur in standard quantum field theory. So it's really a challenge for quantum field theory. So what did we do? We analyzed non-standard quantum field theories. And these non-standard quantum field theories were characterized by funny behavior of their derivatives. We didn't have standard two derivative terms, but the leading term had four derivatives. And all the peculiarities came from these four derivative terms, and I gave examples. And these theories, these Lagrangians, or these Hamiltonians, they captured the universal properties of the lattice model. We managed to capture some, but not all, of the peculiarities of the system using the continuum theory. They reproduce the long distance physics and the properties of probe particles. So that's very exciting, but clearly many more puzzles remain. As I said, we, I don't think we fully understand even these theories. I'm completely sure that there are many other examples that we haven't studied, and we don't see any organizing principle that allows us to put these different examples in boxes, tells us what happens. I cannot answer questions like I was asked here. Can I just stare at the show distance Hamiltonian and say, oh, this is going to be exotic? I, well, instead, I really need to solve the system, and then I know whether it will be funny or not. So with these exciting questions, I think I just thank you, and I'll be happy to answer questions. OK, thank you very much for the very enlightening talk. Uh, we, I think we'll have some time for questions from the audiences. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, even for ordinary QFTs, uh, if, if the theory is on a torus, then high temperature and low temperature behaviors must be related, isn't it? Yeah, so high temperature probes what happens at high energy. So it's clearly different than what happens at, at low energies. But if the theory is on a torus, then because the modular invariance. Uh, oh, oh, this is a Euclidean torus. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, okay. yeah, good. I now understand your question. When you say the theory on the torus, you mean we have a Euclidean space time torus. Yes, yes. Right. So I think you have in mind a conformal field theory. This is yeah. the long distance behavior of some more microscopic model. So at short distances, you have some complicated model, say a lattice or what have you. And at long distances, we have a conformal field theory. And there you can ask the question you ask. In fact, it is scale invariant. So we can dilate the whole system and the answers don't change. 
What I was talking about is to compare this conformal field theory that you're talking about to some microscopic model. So at long distances, we have some systems, say on the lattice, say the icing model, and it has spins. And if you look at so the space is not continuous, space is discrete, and there's some degrees of freedom and so forth. That's what we have at short distances. If we look at long distances and we limit ourselves to lo the low lying states, then we see the scale be invariant behavior of the Isaac model. I'm at the critical point of the Isaac model. I see the scale invariant behavior and space becomes continuous. And now I can put it on the torus. I can do all these interesting things. And what I, what I find at long distances is really independent of most of the details at short distances. For example, I can say short distances, I have some nearest neighbor interactions between the spins, but I can also add some next to nearest neighbor and next to next to nearest neighbors. And there's an infinite number of coupling constants I can put on the lattice. And once I tune to the critical point, it's the same critical behavior independent of all these other couplings. So on the lattice, there's an infinite number of couplings and most of them are irrelevant. This is actually a very well-defined technical term that most of the details of what happens at short distances, all, most of these details are gone and are not important at long distances. This is what we normally have in quantum field theory. Okay, what we you. have in these systems is different. And a lot of the short distance behavior remains important at long distances. Thank you very much. Okay, Sokbom raised his hands. <laughs> Can you ask? Ah, yes. So thank you very much for your talk. So at the beginning, when you started mentioning this uh, UVIR mixing, you mentioned how, you know, in, in case of uh, quantum gravity, you can use, I mean, geology actually has proved useful. So my question is, you know, so you, concerning the recent examples of UVIR mixing, do you also see the possibility of uh, making use of this duality transformation? Or do you think that, I mean, actually that that's not that cannot be a general principle for some uh for some reason okay so in the context of string theory we know of dualities we know of dualities that mix long distance and short distance this is a fascinating aspect of string theory and i think we understand it but i'm completely convinced that we should be able to understand it much better our understanding is incomplete because it's very surprising. And the very fact that duality is surprising tells us that we don't fully understand it. Now, you could always say that in the context of string theory, this is quantum gravity. The notion of distance would be an emergent notion. Don't really know what distance means. There isn't really an energy momentum tensor. So we don't know how we measure distances. So all this is for gravity. And if you're a physicist who is not, who are not interested in, in gravity, then say, okay, I don't care. Now, what I'm telling you is that these things can happen even without gravity. And it is interesting first, because these things happen and these are systems that can exist. Some of them might even exist experimentally. But also I think it is telling us something exciting about quantum field theory, something exciting we, can, we didn't know before that such a thing can happen. And if we are really fortunate, this whole thing would also shed light on duality because it will explain how different scales can mix together. So I'm just speculating here, I don't know, but the fact that all these things that happen in different places have some things, the details are completely different, but they have some of these things in common. And the things that are in common are the opposite of this tradition of reductionism, of this going scale by scale, I think this is fascinating. And maybe this will teach us, maybe one of these things would shed light on something else. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Stefan. Hey, hi, thank you for the, thank you for the nice talk. Um, yeah, my question is maybe related to the previous one. Um, so you mentioned these uh, symmetric tensor gauge theories. I was wondering, um, so a symmetric tensor is obviously, we know the metric is a symmetric tensor. 
Um, so does that suggest if we if we have some like UV lattice model of these of some of these theories, can that be a sort of candidate for a UV completion of gravity? Okay, very good question. In fact, the original motivation for the study of these symmetric tensors was to do exactly what you just said. So this was an attempt to get gravity out of a lattice model. This was the original motivation. You can just look at these papers. The original papers did not know that they lead to fractals. That this came later. Personally, I think that getting gravity out of a lattice using this symmetric tensor is totally misguided for a number of reasons, which if you want, I can elaborate on. But independent of whether it gives gravity or not, these models do not give gravity. Let me just put that immediately clear. They have nothing to do with gravity, but they are interesting on their own right. And as such, they should be studied. One way to see that is to just look at the gauge transformation. Let's see if I can get to the slide. The gauge transformation law of the, oops, there's something wrong with my computer. It's here. If you just look at the gauge transformation of the fields, look at these equations. These are, these are the gauge transformation laws. These are not the same as the gauge transformation laws of, in gravity. So right. So these fields do not transform like a gravity. Right. So, but as I understand, there's also, say, the vector charge theory, and that transformation law looks a lot closer to, say, linearized diffeomorphisms. Yeah, that's that's correct, but the high order corrections are completely different. The important thing is that X doesn't transform. In all the, mm -hmm. the, the hallmark of general coordinate transformation is that the coordinate transforms. Mm -hmm. And here, the coordinate does not transform. Mm -hmm. okay. X is X. You do not do reparameterization of X. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I, I, I and that's actually why I think that all these things to find out is a theory of gravity uh, are misguided. Let, let me say it differently. <laughs> In the theory of gravity, you don't really have a gate, a, a, an energy momentum tensor. In the theory of gravity, energy is measured at infinity. The local energy doesn't mean anything. In fact, it's, it's a gauge constraint. These systems have an energy momentum tensor. They have an mm -hmm. Hamiltonian density. So mm -hmm. it can't possibly be a theory of gravity, right? This is the Lagrangian, mm -hmm. and there's a Hamiltonian, which is E squared, Hamiltonian density, which is E squared plus B squared. And it exists, it's an operator in the theory, it makes sense. In a theory of gravity, there is no energy density. It's not a good operator in the theory, it's not gauge invariant. Hmm. So it's a okay. fascinating theory, but not for gravity. Okay, I see. Thank you. Maybe Kiso? Uh, let me ask about how to resolve UBIL mixing in in in, in QFT. So let me recall an old example, Landau Fermi theory. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. So yeah, I, I so in the Landau Fermi theory, there is a UV information, the size of Fermi surface or Fermi momentum KF. So when but in, in the RG, you you observe such UV parameter into some interaction parameter, you redefine some new interaction parameter. So as a result, you can obtain some universal answer. So with the interaction of, or well, redefining some interaction parameter with a KF. So generally, so here, how can you resolve some such issue? Then how can you obtain some universal answer for this UVIR mixing problem. So in, in Landau formula theory, so uh, there is also UVIR mixing as far as I know. So the KF, so but redefining, observing such KF into some interaction parameters and RG, some new parameter appears without any UV information. Finally, I mean, already observed. So then you obtain a universal answer. So here, 
how can you okay so first let me say the UVAR mixing is not a problem it's a property of the system you might not like it you might love it I, I don't know but it's not a problem not something that you have to get rid of but if you have UVR IR mixing, it's not easy to predict in a universal way the IR physics. But even sometimes, even if you have some UV information, I mean UV cutoff or something, for example, in the formic theory, you have KF, then even if so, you have some universal answer, redefining some par parameters of developing such UV information into the interaction parameter. Right. So that, yeah, yeah. that's right. So the theory of short distances still includes, in these examples, still includes more details than the effective theory of long distances. So this is still true. The surprise is that the long distance theory includes still a lot of information of the UV. And the correlation functions change as you change the position a little bit even at low energies. And it's a little bit different than Landau theory. Landau theory has, a, if you look at the theory near the Fermi surface, if that's what you're talking, I believe that's what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And it has some of the same peculiarities, but there is a way of formulating the behavior of near the Fermi surface in a way that fits the standard picture of the renormalization group. This is mostly work of Shankar, and then yeah. express in high energy, the more quantum field theory terms using a, by using, and then expressed using quantum field theory language by Joe Polchinski in his Stasi lectures. And it does have some of the feel of the same UVIR mixing, but the effects here are much more dramatic in the sense of the large ground state degeneracy, the peculiar symmetries, the fact that the UV and the IR limits do not commute. So this, mm -hmm. this is a different beast, and the examples that I presented are also different. And I do not know how to give a coherent description of all of them where you could say, these are the various options, that's all that can happen. I think such a story can ex does exist, but which I don't think would know. I see. Oh, one more. If you have a higher derivative terms, if you introduce some quantum fractions by some deforming such, such a theory, some, for example, scalar theory, then lower derivative term may be generated to destabilize such a theory in, yes. in so principle. That's a good question. Yeah. So, higher derivative. So low, low derivative terms might be relevant operators that destabilize it. But in some of these cases, this is not the case. And in the gap system, first of all, in the gap systems, uh, there are no local operators at all. And if there's no local operator at all, it's not even, there aren't even any relevant operators. So in the gap systems that I presented, these two examples that I presented, and there are many others, uh, there are no, no uh, uh, local operators that can destabilize it. How about symmetric uh, tensor case? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. We can go through one example at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, in the, the symmetric tensor theory, as I presented it here, is not gapless. I said I was talking about the gap once. I see. The gapless one, it's different. And but even in the gap, the gapless ones, when you take this limit, this continuum limit, uh, one of the ways of taking the continuum limit, it's actually stable or robust, and there are no relevant operators that that could ruin it. What is the origin? There's another yep. notion which is common in a quantum field theory for a system to be stable, where it's stable with respect to a certain symmetry. So you impose mm -hmm. a symmetry and you are allowed to fine tune operators provided there's a symmetry that guarantees it. 
And in this case, there is a symmetry that excludes the low derivative terms. So depending on what kind of game you play, if you're willing to impose a symmetry and all these dangerous terms are absent because of a symmetry. But are even they you, not even generated if by- to impose the symmetry, Even if you don't want to impose a symmetry, in some of these continuum models, depending on how you take the continuum limit, these terms are not present. And finally, in the most exciting models, the models are gapped. And once they're gapped, you could check whether there are local operators acting in the space of ground states, and there aren't any. And if this is the case, the model is completely stable. That means that I can change the Hamiltonian a little bit. Is there is a neighborhood? It's not just a point. There is a whole neighborhood in the space of coupling constants when I get this answer. This neighborhood might be small, but it's not zero. It's not measure zero. It's small, but not measure zero. So you you wanted to to ask more about that or? But uh, it's okay. I see. Yeah. So, but is, is any possibility to generate? some quantum fluctuation generate such terms? Well, Even I've told you something about the answer, right? quantum fluctuation. I've already taken all the quantum fluctuations into I account. Okay. I sold the system, <laughs> this is the ground state. Now you could ask, the a proper way to ask this question is not whether quantum fluctuations would change because this is the answer. The question, the proper way to ask the question is imagine you did not start with precisely this system, but you change the, the coefficients, the throw distances a little bit. How will the answer at long distances change? So solve the system again with slightly different coefficients at short distances. What will the effect of this change in the coefficients be at long distances? That's a way to ask the question. To what extent is this behavior that we see at long distances, to what extent is it robust and the small changes of the coefficients at short tr distances? And you can formulate the, this question several different ways. Number one, we limit ourselves to changes of coefficients such that a certain symmetry is preserved. If that's what you're doing, then all of these models are robust. All of these models are stable. But now you could say, well, I don't want to impose these symmetries. I want to add more. Then some of these models are stable and some of them are not. Many of the gapped ones are actually completely stable. You can add whatever operator you want at short distances, provided the coefficient is small enough. I see. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so Jacob, can you ask a question? Yeah, yeah shalom, Nati. Uh, I would like to mention that there are other uh, domains in physics that there is no uh, separations of scale at all. And for instance, if you talk about chaotic systems, then I don't think that uh, one can even phrase it in terms of uh, scales and mixing. It's uh, there is no notion like that. And the other uh, very important uh, physical systems is turbulence. That is also a system that uh, I don't believe that. Uh, one can consider separation of scales because one gets different scales uh, from very different uh, scales that uh, uh, one input. So uh, I think that these are very major uh, physical systems that uh, these ideas of separation of scale uh, do not apply. Well, I know very little about these systems. And... If there are more examples, we should study all of them. Is this Kobe? Yeah. Hi, Nathan. Ah. Hi. Uh, Sangjin, do you have a question? You should unmute. You should unmute your mic. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your great talk. Thank and you. Uh, if uh, not all the higher derivative theory has a UVIL mixing, do you have any intuition 
uh, what should be the other origin of your, I mean, uh, continuum theory yes. to have the UVIR? Good. So at least in these examples, what happens with the, the structure of the higher derivatives in some of them, but not all of them, is that there are some directions in, in field space that the action is not suppressed. So you can have high momentum modes with very low energy. So the higher derivative terms are such that there are high moment, arbitrarily high momentum modes, states, states with arbitrarily high momentum with zero energy or with low energy. For example, a typical example is a scalar field where instead of having a dx phi square plus dy phi square, you have dx dy phi quantity square. So this is a full derivative term. There is no dx phi quantity square. There is only dx dy phi quantity square. So if phi depends only on x but not on y, this term is zero because the, the dx dy of phi kills it. So you can have arbitrary high momentum in x as long as there is no momentum in y. In y direction, the, the energy is zero. So this is how high momentum affects what happens at low, at low energy. High momentum can affect low energy because, because of the form of the derivatives. This is one way it can happen. In, in the other examples, it, it works a little bit differently. But I think it, tell, it gives you the feel of how we can have a, this high momentum physics contaminating low energy physics. I see. So is there any, starting from your model, is there any classification uh, or maybe some extension? Uh, what kind of uh, deformation preserved such a UVIL mixing property? So the question is to what extent the low energy behavior, this is the same question that was asked oh, earlier. Right, right. To, what, to what extent is this peculiar low energy behavior that we see robust? So that under what conditions can right. we change the short distance short distance parameters and still retain the same long distance behavior? The quick answer is that I have no idea. On a case by case basis, I know how to analyze it. And sometimes it's the case and sometimes it's not. All right, thank you very much. So there's one more question, uh, Professor Yun Yu Bang. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, thank you for very insightful uh, talk. Uh, I have just one conceptual question. I think you have al already answered uh, partially uh, to the question of Kisok, but uh, my question is, uh, so you, sh you, you show or demonstrate that you can construct some artificial lattice model and where this, uh, UVIR mixing is realized, then uh, my question is, you can sit down in your office and you can construct any arbitrary Hamiltonian or, 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 or lattice model, and uh, you, you demonstrate this UVIR uh, mixing or whatever. But the question is, any kind of this arbitrary artificial model can be applied to our nature because our yeah. nature uh, should have- yeah, That's a fantastic question. So the, I do not know about the experimental front. I know people are looking for materials that exhibit this behavior. In fact, one of the original motivations to study these systems was to build better quantum memory. Because if we have a system with such a large ground state degeneracy, it would be absolute and should be robust so that if we kick it and change it, this is this whole set of questions that were asked earlier, to what extent it, is it stable? If we have such a system, we can store a lot of information in it. So it's fantastic for quantum memory. And yeah. that was the original motivation, or one of the original motivations to study these systems. So people are looking for systems that, in the lab, that materials that exhibit this behavior. 
And the materials could be naturally found or might be artificial, so they're made in the lab. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any fundamental obstruction to finding such a material because it's a garden variety Hamiltonian that does the job. Right. We just have to find such a material. It might not be easy. As of, the, as of today, this has not been done. Mm -hmm. Once it is done, it will have enormous implications. And I don't see any reason why this shouldn't happen. But it might be difficult. Yeah, but, but from my perspective, the question yeah. is different. Yeah. I was brainwashed, or I was taught or brainwashed, that such things cannot possibly exist uh -huh. because they violate fundamental principles of how physics works. Exactly. Somebody asked me at the beginning of the talk, is this a principle of nature or not? Exactly. If you that's my question. That, yeah. Sorry? That's, that's my question. So when you construct any artificial model, you have to think about, in order to apply this model to our nature, you have to, you have to obey some general symmetry or principle like a causality or unitarity and some oh, these, these models are causal and unitary yeah these models yes. satisfy all the standard principles that you you know and love i see they do not violate any of the standard sacred things in physics mm -hmm. all of them including the ones that come out of string theory or the ones that they uh, appear here in lattice models right <laughs> so they don't violate the basic principles that we know in, 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 in love, they do violate some things that we thought were always true, mm -hmm. but they're not always true as these examples demonstrate. I see. Now, if we can also find them in nature, that would be a nice bonus. Uh -huh. But for me, the mere existence of these examples is shocking. And uh -huh. I think that studying them will teach us something new about how quantum field theory works, I how see. phenomena with high momentum that reflects short distance can affect behavior at low energies. But and if you extend your argument, yeah. if you if you ex extend your argument to the, for example, in your last example, uh, two limiting process saying the lattice constant A and the number of lattice if you take it to different limit, you have different different uh, result. So if I apply the same principle in, in time dimension, you, you make uh, lattice, lattice uh, realization along the time axis and you have same, same uh, property taking different limit, then you may violate uh, causality isn't it? Well, all these things are done only in space. So the funny limits I are see. not, a, time is be treated in a conventional way. Okay. And the funny limits are only in space. So this does not violate causality. But again, if you're sitting just in your office, you can, you can construct the lattice model even along the time dimension. Then you can find some bizarre effect. But yeah, but these are not, yeah, you're completely right, but that's not what we're doing. We keep the time derivative either with the lattice or in the continuum. The derivative in the time direction will always say conventional. I Let see. me give you some examples. I have a list of some Lagrangians here somewhere. Right. This thing. Yes. So you see here, the time derivative is conventional. The spatial derivatives are funny. I see, I see. And the same thing is true here. There's a single time derivative of, in, in the electric field. Right. So at least you obey causality. Oh, causality and unitality are manifest in all these right. examples. Right. Okay. Causality and unitality, the spatial behavior is all messed up. I see. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, we had lots of questions, but are there still more? I mean, then just feel free to. More questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Professor Cyborg for a very enlightening talk again. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. And thank you for us for staying so late and for asking so many questions. Yeah, so thank you so much. It was a very helpful talk. Mm, thank thank you. you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Where are you, Kobe? I don't see you.
I think he's not. Uh, he, he left already. I, I okay. think so, yes. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Joseph, for Yeah.